uh, Cuppy1212. Thank you for the follow. I see you and Hearth Homes. What a lovely start. Minute and 45. We're just getting the Geek Bomb Patreon book club backers into the chat. And I poured a wine. <laughs> oh, and thank you, and Crisp. 10 months. Amazing. Appreciate you. Oh my god, that's why. You're a knob. You're an idiot, Maud. And sometimes I worry about you. You're a streamer and you can't unmute a microphone. Mm. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I fed my dog in time. Welcome to Book Chat. It is the time of October. Oh no, Michelle, not the computer. Oh man, Adam says hi. Oh, that's sweet. Hi, you ding dongs. Um, sorry for that embarrassing start. I was like, why doesn't it work? Yeah, because I was muted. Man, seriously drink every time I do that. We'll all be seriously sick a lot of the time. Uh, we have a new book for October for Book Chat, and it is Grave Peril, which is book number three from The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. If I were to describe The Dresden Files, I tell my friends that it is a book about a wizard called Harry. And they're like, oh, it's Harry Potter. And I'm like, well, no, this one's set in, set in Chicago. He's a lot older and he's a lot more cynical, but it deals with more of the supernatural elements um, instead of the sort of wizarding and majestic elements. Um, a big hello to everyone in book chat. We got Avery, Colleen, Darian, Lisa, Michelle and her fried nearly computer, Kate, Radia, Seb, who is here but not here, Sprinkles, Strawberry Brie, and there he is. I cannot believe you weren't here 10 minutes before, Thierry. This is your series. 
So my relationship with the Dresden Files, I discovered it when I got audiobooks and really started leaning into them heavily in 2017. This was a series that I just absolutely fell in love with in terms of sort of like providing a nice palate cleanser in terms of books. I would read sort of like long lengthy series that I would know would be a good time with characters that I enjoyed more and more uh, in a world that I was, you know, really invested in. Uh, the, the general consensus with this series though is that books one and two are finding their feet but it really comes into its own by book three and we are covering book three today. We did talk about books one and two in the Discord only iteration of book club, Geek Bombs book club, which took place in 2019. Uh, I think it was like September and December or something that we read the books. They're really, really easy to listen to. I'm surprised it's not sort of like a YA-esque type uh, series only because of the ease in which you can get through it. So I want to hear um, from the chat. Yeah, four years. Yeah, yeah, it has been that long. Uh, I want to I want to hear from the chat if you've read Dresden Files before or if this was your first time. And to those that have uh, not listened to the Dresden Files before, please let me know in the Discord chat uh, by unmuting because I would love to hear what you thought of it. Farwell says, Butch is really good at pacing. Once the plot gets going, it's hard to put it down. Yeah. And it's sort of like a, a procedural in a way where, but it also has through follow lines, like a really good series should. So there's like your monster of the week in a way, but because the world gets more and more expansive, he doesn't, he just does such a good job in like talking about sort of like, it's, he's a mystery. Like at the end of the day, he's a detective. Uh, and so he has a problem to solve more often than not. Um, and the way that the story expands over the course of 16 books, Thierry, how many books? I'm always going to ask you. 17. 17 books. Plus two anthologies. Plus two anthologies. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, Thierry, how many times have you listened through the series now? Uh, three uh up to peace talk i only read peace talk and battleground once mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but up to grave peril i think this is my fifth time for grave peril what do you like about it it's the storytelling it's uh, and the world building it's it yeah it 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 goes like n not just one like a vampires or fairies or Werewolf, it, it's very everything, and like, and in f future books, you get even in more in more stuff like uh, that. Will if we when we get there, we're I'll talk about it because okay. spoilers. <laughs> yep, got it. Like that, fantastic. Uh, Colleen is correct. There are a couple of graphic novels in there as well, and uh, Michelle says I've read the comic book adaptations of the first couple of Dresden books too. Michelle, I know that internet's a bit hit or miss. If you can, if you are there and you can hear us. Um, how did you find the comics? I thought they were really good. I'm on um, like three devices right now trying to offset the load. It's, um. it's working. It's working. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I thought they were really good and good com companions. The art was good. I'm trying to find them on my tablet um, to see who did the adaptation. Mm. Um, but I do remember liking them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Fantastic. I didn't do the comics because as I've been very, very clear about my love of words, uh, paired with my imagination. And sometimes when it, if it's a graphic novel or if it's a comic, it sort of takes that uh, from me a little bit and they tell me what everything should look and uh, look like. And I'm like, that's my job. Uh, Emberant Elia uh, has says, I've read the whole series. I picked it up around 2010, I think. Uh, the first book was written back in 2000. So Jim has spent over two decades writing this series. It's kind of like your R.A. Salvatore where it's just like you get a good thing going, you've built the world, the characters are so sort of like rich and you just go. I think that's such a feat in itself. 
Um, and I also don't think that it's too uncommon for a series to get better after a couple of books as well and continue to sort of like um, find, get better and better in their, in their writing too. Um, Avery said, it's my first time reading them. I read one and two last month so I could be fully caught up for this one. Uh, so Avery, I'm going to continue that conversation. Did you notice a difference in the sort of um, style, the writing, the finesse from books one and two to this one, book three? did uh, I actually kind of struggled through one and two to be quite honest like can't really explain it but it just like I felt like I was trudging through them like they were very like the first one I thought felt rushed and the second one I thought like too much was being thrown at me but this one like the pacing just feels so much better and like I don't feel like I'm being overwhelmed with information and um yeah I've, I feel like I'm definitely enjoying this one a lot more it's so weird. I remember I was so obsessed with this series that I bought a copy for my mum because like she powered through all of the Laurel K. Hamilton books. Uh, she loved those. And so we – and she really, really loved contemporary fantasy of that sort of like more – dark and sexy sort of nature and I was like mum have I got the series for you anyway I gave it to her in the afternoon she gave it back to me in the morning and she's like meh and I was like what do you mean what do you mean meh I couldn't believe it I have like Thierry probably very rose tinted glasses when it comes to this series um because I really I, I enjoyed the first and second book it's just my cup of tea in terms of like you know nerdy supernatural stuff uh mixed in sort of with the detective stuff so i i really dug it um but it's really interesting to to hear the this feedback uh i was on goodreads looking at um the audience feedback as well fan feedback and it was painfully obvious that there was a definite different opinion on the series from women compared to men. And I cannot believe that I kind of fall into the male category of just sort of like that rose tinted glasses being like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And women being like, I don't like being inside Harry Dresden's head. I don't like how he describes women. I'm really sick of these women being sexualized. I've noticed that all of the women are gorgeous and I know how their breasts fit within their shirt. For some reason, it just didn't catch with me like it has for a lot of other books that we've read um and I want to kind of read this book again with that perspective on it perspection perspective perception on it um because this is like sort of I feel going to be the dividing point where it's like I really like uh the storytelling but I'm not uh, fond of the character descriptions um that's like that's always like a really sort of you can draw the line down the sand with that particular part of the book but I'm going all over the place when talking about things who else um, had only just started oh Kate this is also my first time through the series I read the other two when we read them for Geek Bomb Book Club Kate did you notice a difference between books one and two and three where it notoriously finds its feet A difference between the um, pacing. You so I felt like I found it a lot better in this one. The first two were obvious kind of, you know, when a writer finding their voice and finding a formula that works. I mean, there's lots of series that I have rose tinted glasses about too, that going back and reading them, it's just like, oh my God, I can't believe I even continued reading this. <laughs> this one is so bad. But you can see the growth, especially with the world. Like, I just posted there, like, my feelings on Harry, but, like, the world <laughs> is getting richer. Characters are way more interesting than he is. Like, I kind of wish that one of them was the main character. Like, I'd rather have Karen as the main character than Harry, but yeah, you know, we wouldn't have the wizard part, I guess. Okay, so Kate's description of Harry is... <clears throat> Harry is a fedora-wearing, katana-collecting neckbeard. He's lucky the rest of his world is interesting and the other characters are cool outside of their boob description. That, and then Avery says, yeah, that's pretty much how I feel about it too. Uh, Radio says that Murphy is the main character would be great. 
She's a really interesting character. Absolutely. I think what's really hard. Do we go into it straight away? I get, are we there? Are we talk? We're there. I guess we'll just jump in with with this part then. Um, I think what's really difficult is, and what I was reading about online, not not as a defense at all, but because we're in Harry's head, we are seeing his thoughts and his gaze, but then his actions prove quite honorable and in a way safe. So even, and it's like, for me, it's like the amount of times I walk around and if I look at men when I'm walking, I see, I see what. And if sometimes they're really subtle and I'm like, thank you. When they're not, I'm like, e. Um, but it's just that thing where it's like men's gaze and what they notice. And that's kind of how it is. And when you've got a guy writing about a guy, that's the perspective that you will get. And I think what we really do have to honor is that even though that's always going to be the first thing that they notice, um, you know, they're always going to be beautiful. They're going to be in a way sexualized, which I can't stand about being a woman online. So I totally get the other side of this. But at the same time, there's something about Harry when he has that I'm chivalrous and I'll always help a woman in distress. And, you know, even though that's a little archaic or... Um, uh, you know, inverse misogynistic, whatever it is. And I'd love someone to help me kind of explain that side of it. But if his priority is going to be the safety of women, I can't fault that. Even though he has a very difficult relationship with Susan Rodriguez. At, yes, Miss Necromancer, every single woman is a goddess. Uh, I was looking into feedback about that as well. And someone was just like, yeah, there's no ugly women in the, in, that exist in the world. Um, someone gave feedback on that again, saying we are in a supernatural world where a lot of the people that are in this world are actually supposed to be physically enhanced. When you become a vampire, you look a lot more attractive as a t like a way to lure, um, you know, the the fae in the world are supposed to be are supposed to be incredibly beautiful. Um, it does, though, kind of seem a little bit ridiculous that every single woman, um, even um, uh, Mickey's wife, even though she'd put on some weight, she was still incredibly beautiful and was in a time. Oh, yeah, it was quite interesting, but I definitely heard that description over and over and over again. Um, and Riley actually brings up a really great point. Would it be worse to hear him describing women as ugly to him like if he was like you know she was very average in the face actually he he has done that before I think it was in the last book where he described a woman she would look a bit better if she'd done her makeup differently I believe because I remember being a little bit like I had a bit of a knee-jerk reaction for that um <laughs> Jimmy says, ugly is such a not needed word, just like can't. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Kate says, even Karen, though, the only normal woman is described as hot first, but then how capable of a detective she is. Uh, and then, of course, Charity is also super gorgeous and strong. Yeah, yeah. Um, or just the woman in the black coat came over to me and maybe not mention her figure at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, even younger women like the college students in Full Moon says Avery. Yes, all gorgeous, all gorgeous. Um, Michelle says, I think that there's some purposely B-movie noir or pulp tropes, including the babe only rule. I I think so too. And I think we, I would, I would really love to sort of figure out who Jim Butch is writing these books for, because I think it's him. Um it's what he likes, it's his genre, and it's his sort of dreamscape in a way. Whoa, Hearth Holmes is hosting. That scared the crap out of me, but thank you. <laughs> um, Michelle, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? The Babes Only Rule, uh, other books that it might've been in, what that's all about, hi. <laughs> hi, um, I think it just reminds me of like, old movies and um where it's like the detective and then you know the femme fatale walks in and um 
just like everyone he meets is gorgeous and same thing with like and also um, all want him in a way yes yeah, yeah he's, he's like, very desired yes and i just think that there's no well maybe there's a way <laughs> there's a way that jim like doesn't hear that but i can just like you can like hear it in, in with like the crinkle of the old um voiceover um with harry's voiceover as like that point of view where everyone's you know i think harry has his own rose tinted glasses too and that's sort of part of the trope um i think mm. but yeah it just reminds me so much of that that i really have to think it's purposeful so we're looking at these books were published in 2000 so obviously mm -hmm. the idea the concept was leading up to 2000 this is kind of like your dick tracy era it's yeah the, it's the noir detective and you're right, like even like the witnesses are trying to seduce him somehow. Yeah, it's, you're incredibly right. Uh, what do we call like the babes only rule? What is, what is that? Is that just like media skewed to men and then full, yeah, full stop? Yeah, I mean, there's also like low budget stuff where it's like you have to draw in an audience somehow. And so it's like, well, one of the ways is that we'll just only cast <laughs> beautiful people, right? I think it's a very like 60s low budget because um the other thing that was popular in the 60s that was like beach movies and stuff mm. so you know it it has like notes of that where it's like we know it is what it is and <laughs> this is how we're gonna get people is we'll cast only beautiful people you know it's very hollywood you can hear a producer somewhere being like uh -huh. no 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 and the loophole is they're not in their lingerie it's swimwear yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you completely. Does anyone else want to sort of add into that? Oh, Miss Necromancer, do you want to share that last comment? On the HBO boob tax? Yeah. It still exists yeah. today, huh? Uh, it's just, it's back then it was like the woman's just curvy, but now it's like because everything, you know, is so escalated, it's pull out like sex and nudity that like what happened with game of thrones it's like there's not that much sex in game of thrones there is but not that much it's because you you want all like the normie douchebaggy guys to stay who would never watch fantasy politics show a day in their life right mm. yeah you're right it's yeah <laughs> it's called game of thrones because it's about the intricacies of politics and you can see them kind of like start fading out and you're like and there's boobs L lots of them at least one per episode and they're like done we'll sign off on it um i think what you've seen is that it is sort of um the byproduct of decades if not centuries of men making decisions and making content ideally for themselves um and miss nakamura said yeah you're agreeing that most authors will write for themselves you write about what you like you write about what you want to write what you would want to read i would say uh, but also your comment of yeah, so desired. Dirty hobo wizard wearing a constantly dirty jacket all the time with his flat white man no ass. <laughs> you, you just get the burn happening. <laughs> oh, why aren't you a comedian? If anyone dared sort of like try to uh, heckle you, <laughs> just the roast you can do is not. Um, so yeah, I think the feedback, what's really interesting, and I, I haven't heard Jim sort of talk about this at all, but one would imagine he was just like, yeah, it was 20, 20 years ago. I was a young guy writing a book for me. And that's like, he was able to experience ideals as if he was Harry Dresden. That's what you get. Um, did it bog the story down for me? No. Was I able to kind of see it for what it was and move on? Yes. So that is something uh, I, I really, really love the, oh, Bob's, uh, Half Home said that they did Bob Dirty in the show. Yeah, it was really bad. Um, but I think the part where it's like, it starts to cross the line for me is, so we've, we've spent a sort of um, a little bit of time discussing that Harry is a man. He looks where he looks and because we're getting his point of view, that's how we see it, what's going on in his mind. Um, but his actions are more honorable and he 
tends to treat women better in a sense that, you know, even though he's the man and his job is to rescue and to save and protect, um, it's not the other way, which is to seduce and to take advantage of. Um, so I think, yay, even though this is protagonist, he can't exactly be a creep. I get concerned with the character Bob. So Bob is a spirit, again, who's centuries and centuries old, who is living inside this skull. And he's technically, in a way, hired by Harry to help him um, with the supernatural and what, what occurs because he's got centuries of knowledge. Um, Bob's weakness, however, is that he is a, an absolute perv and creep, uh, but he just doesn't have a body to act upon it. Uh, here, yeah, I'd love everyone to sort of, now that we're sort of talking about uh, the problematic uh, sexualizing in this book, Bob. Uh, Avery says, yeah, and Bob's actions are framed as comedic because I think 20 years ago it was. If he can't do anything and he's trapped inside, he's a spirit. He's not, I don't think he's a demon. He's a spirit. Uh, Ivari says Bob is always problematic. I think that when he, he's not being corrected or he's not being told no, it's more of a not yet or not this time. It's enabling. And I feel like every guy group, hopefully not every guy group, but the chances are every guy group has a Bob. Uh, it's the Barney Stinson. It's the one guy who is the pervy creep who just wants to land a woman or just give me a look or show me photos of, that your girlfriend sent of her nude. You know, they just kind of cross the line because they're... That's a long time. Maude, that's a long time trope too. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about like the characters. I, I mean, it's not as popular now, but it's been around for a long time. That kind of funny pervert sidekick character. It's always been a thing. Yeah. And I think that my tinted glasses kind of gained clarity j mainly around Bob. Master Roshi was a little perv, wasn't he? Good, good example, Farwell. That was a good one. Uh, M. The cartographer says Bob is a dirty old man. <laughs> Sprinkle says Bob is the Dr. Psych character from the Harley Quinn show. Uh, and also 100% of Joey her. Joey and Friends. Joey and Friends. He was. But I think he got away with it because he was also kind of like intellectually stupid. In Bob's case, he's intellectually brilliant. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Kate says friends is problematic in so many levels. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, Hartholm says 20 years ago that was considered funny. I think that it's a, a really great thing to know that even in 20 years, we kind of realize that having that trope is just not really a thing anymore. And hopefully people, guys that have one of those pervs in their group aren't enabling, aren't laughing it off and then warning their the girls around him they're actually addressing it and just saying like it's absolutely unacceptable behavior uh, because it's that thing where every girl knows another everyone knows a woman that's been assaulted but not every guy knows a dude that's done it uh, but it is interesting how things have changed in that way uh, oh there's another example Eddie Cosmo says um, Jir Jiraiya from Naruto I haven't seen Naruto yet uh, but Samantha in Sex in the City was a Bob of the series. In a way, she was also challenging that trope by it's a, that's a really interesting conversation because it's like, is she just as bad or is she turning the script so much on the head that it's like a pendulum swing in the other way and was more uh, taking ownership of sexuality back from men? That's a whole thing. Uh, Kate says, I think 20 years ago, every guy knew a guy or knew a guy who knew a guy or knew a guy who had a relative who had committed some sort of assault. And there you go. Uh, Samantha was a self-aware perv. <laughs> okay. Really interesting discussion. Uh, we haven't actually talked about Grave Peril, the summary and what it's about. So let me read out the summary. Uh, that's you can find on the Wikipedia. This is about a sixth of the whole summary. So I find it really, really interesting that no one has complained about pacing. In fact, the pacing in this book is the best it's ever been. And yet when talking about the summary, a sixth of it is the first half of the book 
and five sixths of it is the second half of the book. So obviously a lot is about to go down. We will not be spoiling the second half of the book at all. But here is the synopsis and summary. So this is spoiler territory for the first half. This is the summary of what happens in the first half of Grave Peril. And then afterwards, we were talking about the characters that we've been introduced to. And Thierry has done amazing fan casting. Dresden and Michael Carpenter, a knight of the cross, try to track down a bewildered but dangerous ghost in Cook County Hospital. Are nearly ensnared by Dresden's fairy godmother, the Lananshi. That's an interesting way to spell it, Lananshi. Uh, then arrested by the Chicago police. Harry is bailed out by his girlfriend, Susan Rodriguez, then receives an official invitation to represent the White Council at a Red Court vampire party. He refuses to allow Susan to accompany him. While trying to rescue a young seer called Lydia, Harry is attacked by two Red Court vampires, Kyle and Kelly Hamilton. Kelly also sexually assaults him. Uh, he manages to injure Kelly by pulling down the roof of a warehouse and is sent into a narcotic slumber. He has a flashback dream in which he recalls events three or four months prior when Special Investigations, Michael and he, went to capture uh, Leonard Kravis, a sorcerer, cult leader and serial killer. The dream ends up diverging from reality. In the dream, a demon summoned by Kravos kills Michael and eats Dresden alive. When Dresden awakens, he discovers that the nightmare's dream attack was both real and powerful, draining Harry of much of his magic. Harry, real Harry realizes that the nightmare will attack his friends and allies. He tries to warn police lieutenant Karen Murphy and discovers that she believes he's already in her office. In Harry's guise, the nightmare puts Murphy in a nightmare-filled coma. Dresden tries to help by putting Murphy into a dreamless sleep that he says will last until dawn. He then goes to Michael's house to warn him, but Michael's nine months pregnant wife, Charity, has gone to a 24-hour convenience store and while there, met the nightmare disguised as Harry. So that's the first sort of like half of the book and what we'll be chatting about. We are introduced to a lot of characters. Um, I guess the first thing that I want to get into is that we are introduced to a major, major character with very little exposition. In fact, you start to realize that Dresden and Michael have known each other for years and have worked together throughout this time, that it's sporadic. It's not a consistent sort of working relationship that they have and that whatever adventures you know or rescues they've gone to together charity is not happy about it charity does not like dresden because when dresden is around that means there's shit going down and michael has to step up and help but charity doesn't like that because she doesn't want him to get hurt very understandable um we learn that the knights of the cross uh are literally kind of like God touched in a way. They are able to wield this very sacred and divine blade. Michael's is called Amarachus. They are paladins. Um, yeah, so he's got the divine blade, um, which apparently has part of like the nail from the cross embedded in, imbued into it. Uh, and he has the power of faith on his side. Uh, what was everyone's impressions of Michael Carpenter? Did you like him as a character? Did you enjoy sort of like using faith as a part of a supernatural arsenal? And did you think that he was a bit boring or did he outshine Dresden because they were so different? Who wants to weigh in about Michael? Avari says, okay. I love Michael. Jimmy. Yes. So uh, uh, when I when I was reading the book, Chris, uh, I know I ebook like, this time. Did you miss? Yes, yeah. yeah. Did I, I, I didn't swing for the audio version this time. I know that James Masters is very good at it, but I was just like, I'm going with ebook. Okay. But when I was reading it, and uh, came across the character, my thought was like, I don't recall this guy being in previous episodes. I mean, uh, books that we read i was like i don't know where did this guy come from yes and, and it was like you said 
yeah, it was, it was established that he'd been working with him for a while. And then uh, I remembered, uh, I think it was maybe the second book or something, when he, like, knocks him down or something like that, and, and Harry's trying to fight him off or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, is that it kind of, like, he's kind of dull in a way, but it's just because I guess he's, uh, uh, you know, neutral good or neutral... Oh, lawful, lawful good. good. So, L- lawful. So he's not... He's not... Pious AF. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So, like, when you come across someone like that, you may think, okay, is this guy just pretending to be pious so that he can uh, lord over other people and, you know, control them? And then, uh, but, you know, it's not necessarily the case. I'm just saying that that was my opinion of him. It, and, you know, like, Dresden, being the, the jerk that he is, is always going to try and one-up him or at least try and sneak past him. You know, in a way, which never works out for Dresden, as you already know. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's generally my opinion on him. You had a very similar opinion when I first read the book. I actually thought that Michael kind of bogged it down a little bit; was a little bit preachy. Um, but it's it's interesting how I see him now and doing research and getting a, a vast, you know, people's perspectives on the book. How adored he is, and it's funny that this time around. I've recognized that he is the light to Dresden's dark. They are, the dichotomy is like polar opposites. Like these two people should really have nothing in common and their paths never cross. Harry Dresden, serial bachelor. The moment in the car when uh, Michael's like, have you told her that you, you love her? You should marry her. And he's like, what? <laughs> Commitment foam. No, I've been dating her for a little bit. Uh-uh. I thought that that was like, you just really get an understanding of how different they are and how different their values are. But initially when I read the book, being quite agnostic or someone that really had very little to do with religion, I found it quite interesting that religion played such a big part in this. And I worried that it was glorifying religion in a particular way. And then it wasn't until this book that I really truly realized that, I mean, because you had uh, Harry Dresden's perspective, which is like, I don't buy into religion. That's not my jam. Um, Like I will try to abide by, um, you know, what I say and my language somewhat respectfully and I, but I'm, I'm not going to change who I am uh, or please anyone in that way. Uh, We are working parallel, but I'm not sort of like in that, in that field. So Harry Dresden is very much your agnostic sort of representation, non-religious, And then Michael Carpenter is your very deep ingrained in religion. Uh, I thought that it was actually dealt with in a really uh, clever way because only recently in this read did I realize that it was, um, you've got your witches, you've got your fae, you've got your werewolves, you've got your vampires, you've got your knights. And the fact that it just so happens to have that like religious uh, faith there's no preachiness about it. It's just literally quite like it's almost like another supernatural facet in the arsenal of, of what's available to combat evil. And of course, when you're talking about like evils and demons and the supernatural and, you know, things that go bump in the night and people that want to destroy others or do dark magic, it just makes sense that the absolute antithesis of that is good, pure and what faith is. But I really like that it's just another supernatural part in this supernatural world, in a way. Uh, People are weighing in on this in the chat as well. Uh, I just want to say a big thank you to Hearth Homes for being really vulnerable and sharing that, you you know, if you have past religious trauma, the Michael parts are a little bit more difficult. I totally understand and I get that. Uh, And Kate saying, look, I'm right there with you. As soon as he said that Harry needed to make an honest woman out of Susan, I was like, nah never going to be on this guy's side because he was a little preachy in that moment. I totally uh, agree. Avery says, I like him as an opposite of Dresden, mainly because I find Dresden getting called out hilarious. And that's exactly what happens. Like Michael checks this guy and Dresden kind of listens. And it's like a bit of a, not an alpha male, because like Michael doesn't need to play the game. He's just the most sure and centered and grounded person that he makes Harry look erratic, you know, unstable. I just think that that dynamic is really, really great. Um, But he's not, 
he preached in that moment and I thought he was stepping out of line a little bit. Like that's got nothing to do. You're not in the relationship. You do your thing. He's not hurting anyone-ish. Uh, it's another conversation. Um, but, you know, in terms of using faith as a, a weapon, <laughs> uh, Michael does a really good job of it. I don't know. I think it's, it's I'm, I've enjoyed it more than I ever have is what I'm trying to say. Um, Firewall says, I remember thinking that he was a little wooden in this book, but he's grown into my favorite side character. There you go. Um, and then Kate says, I know I shouldn't have any bias against highly religious Christian characters, but my queerness mixed with religious trauma is just too much to get over. I hear you on that. It's, and it's an interesting kind of addition um, to a supernatural world. But I will say, third time through, third time through, it, it, and then having a full understanding of who Michael is throughout the entire series, because we get a lot more of him it does change. It does change a little bit. Miss um, Nacromancy says, if you look at Michael through a D&D lens, clerics and pal paladins uh, only have power when they believe. So his belief does make him as powerful as a wizard. Yes. And I think that that's a really good way to look at it. Instead of it being sort of like, uh, you know, subtle propaganda <laughs> or something like that or having any kind of like sway or being preachy or recruity or shame inducing whatever it is that religion can do to someone i see it as a dnd character like a cleric or a um, paladin absolutely and i think having that kind of perspective and seeing him as a as a you know an npc in the board you know helps with that um radia says that michael isn't a sidekick he's the main character of his own separate story yeah and it's you know, so wholesome. <laughs> Hearthome says, yeah, I like that Dresden uh, was willing to be civil and respectful. I mean, that is all I can ask of anyone, really. Uh, Emberant Elia says, one thing I found interesting about this series is how many supernatural slash mythical slash spiritual slash religious elements are pieced together in a world that still felt grounded in our reality. Yeah. That's called A plus world building, huh? Great comment. Lisa says, I like him for the exact, uh, I like him for exactly for the reason that he is the polar opposite of Harry. It keeps the story interesting for me. Uh, Colleen says, you know, using holy water, even Harry uses holy water. So it's actually not a, it's like not out of the realm of possibility that religion and faith plays a big role in a supernatural world. Uh, Hart says, Michael wasn't preachy to Dresden ever that I know of. Uh, I mean, the, the conversation about if you should really tell your girlfriend that you're unsure about, that you love her and marry her, that was a little, eh, baby? Uh, and, you know, yeah, talking about sort of premarital sex. It's like, Michael, he's not religious. That's not his prerogative. Um, and Radia says that as well. It's especially weird to hear him preaching about marriage before you really even know his character or he and Harry's relationship. I think that that was a way to sort of like speed dial into where they were at in their relationship because they do have a past. I completely agree with what Jimmy said earlier though, which was like we were, he was kind of just thrown into it. And the way that they introduced him was so ingrained and natural and like, you know, they hit the ground running that you're kind of like, where did he come from? So that took a little bit. And I'm not sure if it was clear enough that he hadn't been introduced before because he was introduced like an old friend slash previous character uh, and the fact that they had worked together and they uh, spoke about a situation that occurred a few months ago but it wasn't in a book was a little bit confusing as well um colleen says i think there's a certain amount of balance he does get preachy but he also represents a stable family perspective yeah uh the nail from the cross is his focus uh the way that the pentacle is for dresden Really well said, Colleen. Uh, I'm interested to see Michael throughout the series, says Kate. My gripes about some of the character choices aside, I'm invested in the world. Ooh. Um. <laughs> Colleen says, stay in your lane, Michael. Uh, Lisa says, that's why I love urban fantasy. I get to read about all these supernatural things, but it feels like it could happen in our world. Mm -hmm. Escapism just by turning the corner, you know. Kate says, question, and I don't want huge spoilers, just confirmation or denial. Are there any other necromancers further in the series? 
My name shows my interest in that subject. <laughs> Miss Necromancer. Lol. I just want some cool, evil, badass necromancer and not some schlub charlatan. Uh, Thierry, did you want to answer that with a yes or no? <laughs> Can I say which book? <laughs> there you go, Kate. An entire book is dedicated to it. <laughs> And it also, it's in my top three books. Which one was that one? Uh, Deadbeat. See, I've listened to them back to back. So I have no understanding of like which book did what. Uh, book six, to be more precise. Not the one with the hotel convention and hotel. That was my least favorite one. Oh, uh, wait, no. Uh, might be wrong. But let me check my notes. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but Farwell also answered that in the comments saying, yes, <laughs> so many necros, Sorry. necromancers. Yes. Uh, book seven, book six is the hotel one. That beat is book seven. Gotcha. All right. So I knew the number, not the book. All right. Uh, oh, he meets Butters. Oh, Butters, man, their story the arcs. Best. Their story arcs get so good. I couldn't stand Butters at the start. Now I'm just like, ah. Die for him. <laughs> Dead Beast Book 7 says Manta 173. Hello, Manta. Uh, if you're lurking or if you haven't been in here before, please introduce yourself in the chat. We do book clubs uh, on the first Wednesdays of the month. We cover the same book, part one and part two. Uh, Kate, no, it's a different Butters. It is a, Butters is a character who works at the morgue, uh, who you'll meet in a couple of books' time as well. Um, Okay, so talking, does anyone else want to add into uh, a conversation about Michael or the Knights of the Cross, um, how he was introduced into the books, uh, his relationship with Harry? Have we touched upon all of that or does anyone else have any kind of Michael combo that they want to get into? I just keep reading out your comments and I just want to make sure that you have a space in here to chat. Like if... If you just get a thought and you want to interrupt me, like permission granted. Well, I compared in the chat the, the relationship between <gasps> yes. Dresden and Harry to uh, Michael being like Captain America and Dresden being Tony Stark. I loved that because you've got, oh, KP Dubs gifted a sub to Lisa. That's really sweet. Thank you, KP Dubs, giving the subs. Uh, I really, really like that analogy because what you've got is this chaotic person who's a little self-centric, who will kind of put other people in danger for the greater good to make sure he's like, hey, listen, you got to come help me. She's going down, uh, you know, and they're like, I have a family or I have other commitments. It's like, doesn't matter. This is the priority. And he kind of leads you in that particular way. That's Harry. Uh, and then you've got Captain America, who is very lawful good, who doesn't like swearing, um, who wants to put others perspectives first which is not what ha harry knows best um whereas michael's wanting to kind of think outside of just himself in a way uh play the board says hello i'm a huge dresden files fan i reread the series at le i reread the series at least yearly i've been lurking hi play the board uh, I read out comments as they come through. There's very little structure with this. Uh, I just spoke about the summary. We're only talking about the first half of Grave Peril. But we're talking about the characters that have been introduced into this book. We previously spoke about how this book is uh, finding its feet a lot more than the first two books. We spoke about how Harry is a bit of a chauvinist pig. But how we're getting the perspective in the mind of a man. And that's kind of what it can look like. Uh, but at the end of the day, his chauvinist traits, I guess the intention is to protect women, which is a whole lot better than hurting women. That's, the, that's our standards as women. That's it. Um, Manta is saying compilation books have most of the short stories. Oh, Sorry, that was in response to A Shift 6. Hello, saying, I think Butcher did add some of the backstories that were skipped in the shorts uh, that were in some of the books, right? And that's when Manta says, yes, compilation books have most of the short stories, including, whoa, including side jobs and brief cases. STS just gifted a sub to play the board. STS, thank you for making new people here feel super, super welcome like that. Really appreciate it. 
What is this now? Oh, and you've gifted one to Ash, uh, A Shift Six. Thank you. Well, my new book, my little book nerds. Uh, oh, Colleen, let's talk about that. Yes, 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 you're wonderful. Colleen, that comment that you just wrote, I would love to explore it further if you want to read it out for me. Um, well, Murphy calls him out for being a chauvinist, but Harry acknowledges that he has this misguided sense of chivalry. Um, he knows it gets him into trouble. Um, he seems, but he doesn't seem to be able to shake it. Um, I don't know if it has to do with his upbringing specifically, but it, it's something that he fixates on and it continually gets him into trouble. Um, and Murphy continually calls him out. Mm -hmm. What do you think the difference between a chauvinist and chivalrous is? Adam Vision, you rated back. We have just been playing tag team all day, my man. <laughs> Hi, all my ding-dongs. We're being raided. Oh, Adam Vision subscribed for 11 months. You sweet, sweet man. Um, to all my ding-dongs, a big hello. Uh, I was playing New World earlier, so I totally know what you've just been coming in from. This is a very different vibe. We are talking about this book, Grave Peril, which is book number three in the Dresden Files series. If you've ever read the Dresden Files, stick around. We are getting into it. What, I got a hype train? <laughs> Hi, Alicien. Thank you so much for your resub for four months. That's really, really lovely. Look at all those ding-dongs in the chat. We got a hype train. Um, oh, the bananas, they just wiggle. They're wiggling bananas now. That's so great. I didn't know that the images could move, but of course, of course they can. Adam, if it's you. Um, oh, Mr. Fox in Socks. Do we not have an exclamation hype thing? Hello, Da Vinci. You just resubbed this morning or at lunchtime and now you've just gifted five subs to add to the hype train, you legend. Cool88, Zomino, Craft Brew Boy, One of the Blades, and Ollie Mawson. You've all been gifted a sub. Thank you to Da Vinci93, whose presence is always felt and welcomed. Thank you so much. And Guy Darlings, doing my favorite little excited face. Uh, hi, Phoenix Finestra. Lovely to have you here. Hands up in the chat if you are coming from Adam's uh, stream and you've read The Dresden Files, or if you like books, let me know. Uh, Colleen, totally cut you off there. Uh, the question that I'd asked you, or if anyone else wants to jump in with this as well, what is the difference between being chauvinistic and chivalristic? Um, my take on it is that chauvinistic, you don't think women are capable of taking care of themselves. Um, you kind of want to put them in a corner or, or, you know, keep them in their place. Whereas with chivalry, um, it's well-intentioned. Um, it is more like, I want to do this to help you or protect you, or um, it, it's not so much doubting the women as just feeling overprotective maybe and I think it's a real old world kind of custom or, or mentality. So you just think he's a bit old school. He definitely flits between like when you described a bit old school, what a chauvinist was, he, he does that a, a little, but I think having Karen around him who he keeps saying, wow, she's so capable. It flits a little bit in between you can't do anything to I'd like to step in and help. Um, Hearth Home says, that's why I love final girls in horror movies. They are badasses. We're reading that for Nerdist Book Club this month. At the end of the month, we'll be talking about the final girls support group, I think it's called, talking about exactly that. Uh, Kryptonite Kelbs says, love books. Initiate This says, I might like books. <laughs> and the cartographer says, consent and agency of women and other genders come to mind when thinking differences in chauvinism and chivalry. Hmm. Uh, Kate says, on the other hand, 
what's happening? Ah, oh, Gory, you some bits. That hype train is still going. That's cool. Hold on. Adam Vision just gifted a sub to women are the best. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Women are the best. Oh, his Adam is a perfect example of chivalry over chauvinistic tendencies. Because I'm like, I'm literally like, I can't figure out tech stuff. I'm so lame and terrible. And he's like, you can, but I'm still going to do it for you. Because <laughs> he asked nicely. <laughs> um, play the board says chauvinism is thinking that women can't. Chivalry is thinking that women shouldn't have to. What an amazing... That's really, really well said. I like that a lot. Um, Zamino, Zomino, sorry, I keep putting that emphasis on the minnow. Uh, Zomino said, I only read the first book and I tried to chat in the comments saying they just get better and better. They are very good. Um, Kate says, on the other hand, isn't just chivalry the word that chauvinists use, but put a positive spin on the idea that wanting to protect women means that you just don't think that they can take care of themselves because they aren't strong enough. I don't know if it's like a manners thing. Because like the difference is, you know, the being chauvinist is like you can't do it. Really, really, really well said, play the board. Um, you can't do this, so I'm just going to have to for you. Ugh, you're a nuisance. You're a, um, you know, your gender is weaker, all that kind of stuff. Misogyny. But I think that chivalry is, you know, I was raised or you know i find my values are in line of wanting to help and assist and yeah do it so you shouldn't have to yes i got this that's a fine line sometimes isn't it if, uh, if i may say an experience jump on that in I had, this is is related to it um oh, sorry uh, the reason why i'm mentioning this is because uh i want to say Back in 2016, right, I went to a convention, and it was one of the first conventions that I've ever gone to, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this person that I went to see was well-known in, in a certain sphere, and she had a lot of gentlemen admirers, right? And so, um, you know, when you go over to the person, you say, oh, yeah, I'm a fan of your work, you know, the usual pleasantries and what have you. And uh, this one gentleman that was standing next to her kept on insisting that he would walk her home. And me, being the person that I am, immediately got anxiety ridden. Like, I'm like, oh my God, why is this guy not leaving her alone? I was like, I can't leave her alone because he's gonna do something wrong. So I literally followed him and he was following her and so I was trying to distract him from, from her oh, man. and get him to walk with me, you know, so that he could get away with it, so we can get away from her. Oy. And it was like, a, and it was like a whole thing. I eventually got, got him distracted away from her and she, she went away. Oh. But well, good it, on but you it, for it, stepping I, in because you're reading his intention, which is not a good one. And you came in and involved yourself with an intention that was a good one. But I want to emulate what Michelle was just saying and just yikes, 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 yikes. <laughs> it was yikes the whole time. But mm. I but like being being a, a being a person who has a five nieces and two and two sisters, I immediately go into like protection mode where I'm just like, oh, you're not messing with my family. You know, like what I think I would be really cool. And I think what we're trying to do, Jimmy, because like the, the step, it's a stepping stone process, right? Respecting women. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got it. It's, uh, you grew up with it. It's instilled with you because of your family. And I think what we're trying to do is instead of I have a sister, I have a mother, I have, you know, and that's that's the way that you can kind of protect women because it's like you can put a family member's face to it and it's like oh so does that mean everyone who was only raised with a dad and have brothers get a full pass to be an absolute dick so it's like we have to kind of be like yeah so it's like the stepping stone is um you know i don't want this to happen to women because they're someone's sister or they're someone's you know um but i think i think the end goal is i don't want to happen to this person because they're a person <laughs> 
because they have exactly. human that, rights. Uh, you're a human being, yes. There exactly. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the fact that Frankenstein's Bride, 95, is reading this book right now. What are the chances? There are millions of books in the world and you're reading the one we're talking about. How cool is that? Um, Adam Vision says, Gaia Darling, a known ally to women. Yay, we like that. Uh, Half Home says, Mod, I watched you on SourceFed and SourceFed Nerd as well as the D&D campaign. You are more than capable. <laughs> ah, oh, this is the tech stuff. I need tech help sometimes. I don't know if you've caught <laughs> the first two minutes of this show, <laughs> but I didn't have sound and couldn't figure it out because there's a button. Um, oh, there's a button. Uh and the cartographer says, looking at the wiki, chivalry originally had to do with being a good horse rider soldier. Horse riding soldier. Yeah, the cavalry. The cavalry and the chivalry for the... I don't know. Uh, Colleen says, my brother-in-law always opens the car door for my sister, but relies on her to do repairs and things that he doesn't feel comfortable doing. I love that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, Emberant... Uh, Alia just commented, uh, Jimmy, on your story saying that was the difference between objectification versus respect. So I love that story, Jimmy, because you just showed respect in that. Uh, yeah, and Hearth Home says everyone has a mother, but unfortunately not everyone was raised with a mother. Uh, <laughs> and KP Dubs is dropping some great puns. Um, alrighty, I think we're getting through the comments. Uh, Kate says, we also live in a society of patriarch driven religions where the man is elevated above all and the women are subservient. So even if you do have a mother or a sister, etc., it's ingrained into the deepest levels of faith to see women as lesser. Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go to respect women. Oh boy, that is big. Um, especially since it's not just one problematic religion. Um, there was a video posted that went viral on Twitter of a man giving a sermon saying women shouldn't wear trousers, shouldn't wear pants because it, it's hard to sit in and they look terrible trying to do it. Whatever it was, it was the most backward shit I'd ever heard. Women shouldn't wear pants. It is against the religion. They are still preaching that a woman's role is in the household to bear children, to bring up children. Uh, and they are absolutely still uh, perpetuating and trying to normalize a very backwards stance. Um, and women be believe that. It's the Mormon religion, says Hearth Holmes as well. Uh, my friend went to a wedding recently um, and their religion was basically there was um, a part in the actual ceremony where they were like, she will obey. She will obey. Oh, what was it? There was a couple of words. And my, my guy friend was texting me that and I was just like, if anyone told me that I was supposed to obey... Oh, what was it? You will, she will obey. She will oblige. What was it? It was basically saying that like her role was to obey. <laughs> Michelle says another, yikes, 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 yikes. Yeah, we do have a long way to go. Uh, so anyway, back to the book. We, uh, this is, I think, the first time we've dealt with ghosts. So book number one is dealing with like occult and uh, raising demons and summoning. Book number two is about werewolves and the loup garou. Uh, so this time around, it's about ghosts and spirits. We have heard about the, uh, what is it? The underworld, the... Loup garou, the P is silent. <laughs> I didn't say it. I made sure I didn't say it. Loup. Garou. No, the lips didn't touch. There was no P. Lu Garou. You say it with the intention of make, maybe saying it, but you don't. Lu. I heard Lu. Half Hones has my back. Someone clip it. <laughs> Fuck. Clipping. But I think I don't. I I intentionally didn't want to say it. Um. Oh. 
clever girl. This is important because this is not a, we don't want to do broad strokes here, but Colleen says, I went to a Mormon church where the women sometimes came in jeans. So there you go. Sometimes pants are okay. The Never Never. Thank you, Radia. Thank you, Play the Board. Uh, we'd heard about the Never Never before. This is like sort of the um, supernatural world that is separated by a veil. The humans cannot pass into it and the spirits can't pass over either unless they summoned, whatever it is. There has been a breach uh, in the Never Never where there's like the, the wall is getting thin to a point that it can disrupt. Uh, Halfheim says the Feyland. Yes, everyone's on it. This is where um, Harry's godmother lives and resides. Again, introduced to this character, heard about her, don't really know what their deal is. How is it a godmother? What's their relationship? Why is she hunting him down? There's a lot happening there. Thierry, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the Lananshi? Okay, without spoilers, that's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the first half, we learned that Harry did a deal with Lananshi. And uh, we, I, I don't remember if she, like, there's the fact that she, uh, he calls her uh, godmother is because her mother knew her. I'll say that much. Oh. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh Michelle's got a great question. Why is their relationship relationship so Oedipal? I've got so many questions. What's really interesting with that is that she's depicted as this the godmother, but she looks, dare I say it, stunning, beautiful, beyond perfection, gorgeous, but young as well. I think Jim does a really good job of like introducing facets of different worlds, sometimes a lot at once, other times just trickling through. And I think that with the Fae, we are seeing a little bit of trickling through. We don't know their relationship. We're in the dark, but we immediately fear this woman. Uh, B-Rock Vandal says she had a contract with Harry's mother. I think they mentioned it during the fight in book three. Good. Because in my notes, it just says they're nearly ensnared by Dresden's fairy godmother, the Lananshi. And then arrested by Chicago police. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is Susan Rodriguez. We know about Susan from book one and book two. She is a writer or a columnist at uh, the supernatural rag that takes place. So it's kind of like, you know, tabloidy and it seems really extreme and people read it and they think it's all fake, but she's actually doing investigative work, <laughs> weekly world news, um, to kind of like stir up. She believes it she knows that this is all happening and a big part of her attraction to harry is that she is the uh, he is the key to all of it he's the conduit he is a huge part of it and he's the ticket to all of that information and access to it um i do like that harry keeps saying that she's a very good reporter she's very good at her job she is 100 percent mixing business with pleasure uh, and as soon as she was sleeping with him, he couldn't, I don't think, as a journalist, he was not allowed to be a source anymore because he becomes an unreliable source. Um, but the relationship between Harry and Susan in this book takes a turn because he's trying to say that he loves her but cannot. Who wants to jump in and talk about the relationship between Susan Rodriguez and Harry and if you think they have a healthy relationship? Anyone? Well, to come back from uh, book one, she's the one that invites Harry to dinner, not Harry. So she's the one making the moves on him. And he's surprised by it. And we have some glimpse in book one, two, and a little bit in three of his past relationship, only one. Mm -hmm. And it really didn't end well. So mm -hmm. that's why he's also reticent of having a relationship. That's true, because when Michael brings up love in the car, he actually mentions her name and Harry snaps. He's like, you are not allowed to mention her. She is not up for discussion. And Harry is basically like relaying and establishing a boundary, saying, dude, you crossed the line with that. That is a no-talk zone. 
Um, you're right though. Susan, as a reporter, as an investigative journalist, is pursuing information and Harry is full of it, you know. So I think it's interesting that it, it makes absolute sense that Susan Rodriguez is, is going after Harry. She's absolutely attracted to him and what he represents, uh, the mystified nature of it. Colleen says super, uh, Susan's very capable. She is, but she's it's a it's a convoluted relationship kate you've got something to say about it i was just gonna say it's like it is toxic but not in the way of some of the relationships that we've like talked about in other books that we've read for book club across the years where these people are obviously attracted to each other and you know if you have a problem saying i love you to someone in a relationship if it's fine if they're on the same page if you're like you know what we're just like you know just having sex you know it's just casual whatever but when you're not on the same page as people like that creates like uneven footing and it, he doesn't know how susan feels about it so obviously it isn't they're not on the same page but also at the same time they're mixing business with pleasure which any adult would know if you ended up getting a relationship with someone at work usually ends very badly so it's just it's not toxic in a way that's like emotionally abusive or like anything like that. It's just mm. not a solid footing. And it's the kind of relationship that tons of people have all the time. But those relationships usually end because you end up realizing you want different things from that person or, you know, you realized I shouldn't have a mixed business with pleasure. Mm -hmm. So while it's not the most unhealthy relationship, it's not the healthiest either. Agree. Um, I think that Susan, I mean, she's in this line of work and she is really good at it. And it takes someone who has uh, a high threshold of bullshit, um, questionable antics sometimes, um, being that kind of reporter. Someone who is a thrill seeker and chases adventure. Um, and I think that that's why Harry is so exciting to her. She is one of the few people that truly believes that this is real. And he's going, it is. And here's some information about it. So not only is he paramount to her success in the career and in the book before, she films a part of the werewolves and uh, the Lugaroo, Lu Lugaroo, uh, and the footage goes global in a way. And so she, it elevates her status in her career immensely. She even mentions it. She's like, I got a tiny bit of video footage and it got me five years of work, like in advanced, you know, it pushed me five years ahead in from one video. So Harry is very much a business opportunity that she is trying to milk. Does she overstep in terms of like trying to get information and use and exploit everything that's going on in his world to benefit her career? Yeah. Is that healthy? No. And I think that Harry kind of has to establish those boundaries, being like, this is off the record. This can hurt people if it gets out. I'll give you this, but you can't have that. Uh, and one of those things is, you know, I'll tell you about some things, but I'm not going to bring you into a room full of vampires for this fall. That is not going to happen. I'm not going to put your life at risk like that. And you shouldn't want to do that. Uh, another thing that I think is a little bit ugh, between them is, and this is where Susan's personal boundaries are really questionable. And this is why I don't think it's a healthy relationship and I, maybe possibly why Susan doesn't love him either. And that is, hey, babe, we had a date last night. You didn't call. You didn't say anything. You just missed. You just didn't do anything. Like we had an arrangement. And he goes, yeah, something really big came up. It's a big ghost. We had to take care of it. You understand. And she goes, totally fine. That is someone who does not have self-worth. If you made a time to meet, and he doesn't let you know and he doesn't show up and he disappears and then you say everything's fine it's okay afterwards that is that it like she's a she's and she doesn't seem like a pushover so maybe she's just not as into him either and if he's doing all of these big adventures and there's big things maybe that's information for her and that's worth it because if he's going out doing all that stuff then that could translate into an article for her maybe but that part of her being absolutely okay with it that is the male fantasy because you can trust me when I say if you make a date and you don't show up and you don't say anything, she is not going to be really sweet about it. She's not going to be forgiving and she's not going to say that's okay. 
Maybe you can make well, it up to me tonight. She ain't. I see the relationship of Harry and Susan like uh, an emergency worker. Like she knows he's always on call. Never like a firefighter that they always have their you know, talkies with them. And when there's a fire, they get called to. So they have to stop everything and go fight the fire. Same thing with the hospital worker. Or something mm. they're always on call. So she, I think she has like an understanding that Harry's like when stuff go bump in the night, he has to fight because he's the only one in Chicago that can do it. So then we realize that in this relationship, and I'm never saying that a partner should always be the number one priority, but in this relationship, Harry's priority is always going to be the supernatural. And there's so much of it that it's almost always a thing. And then Susan's priority is her career. And Harry is the ticket to get that, you know, expanding. So neither of them are prioritizing each other. So maybe they are kind of good together. But I do not think the word love should be exchanged in whatever it is that they've got going on. Uh, I'm going to read out some of the comments. Uh, Manta says, it's definitely not healthy, but loving. Harry can't tell her all the details of the supernatural world, so there's always going to be a big set of his life that he just can't share. B Rock says, "I don't think it's as uh, I don't think it's healthy as they've always. They always seem to just be ships passing in the night. Their relationship revolves around the violence that is Harry's world." Hmm. I agree with Farwell here. I don't think that Harry is capable of a healthy relationship in, um, at this point in his life. No, he's and I think I totally understand that. Um, and it's a really great apt sort of example of it's like being an emergency worker in that sense where it's like you just you cannot have a priority that's not that job because yeah shit goes down lisa says i kind of felt like that she was using him in the beginning of their relationship but now i'm not sure how i feel farwell says i don't think that he can see her as an equal she's just a damsel in distress to him yes and no I mean, she, I think he admires how capable she is and that she is quite forgiving and there's a lot of sort of like um, lax attitude, uh, a lot of flexibility <laughs> uh, in terms of his schedule and what he does. I think she kind of idolizes him. I think she's just in, not even infatuated with him, but what he does and where he is. And, you know, I think that if, you know, if she could obtain those powers, she would jump into that world in a heartbeat. But at the moment, her only in is reporting on it. She's not actually a part of it. And I think if she could live vicariously through Harry, she would. It's that she do, she has a need for danger. Like she's excited by that sort of life-threatening situation. Uh, Colleen says, Harry feels compelled to pretty much uh, to protect pretty much everyone from the supernatural world that he deals with. He also has certain constraints from the White Council. True. Kate says, it's almost like a cop relationship too. When someone's in danger all the time, it's stressful to the partner. And there comes a time when a lot of people just cannot be in those relationships anymore. Agree. And so does Rydia, uh, who says, when she was leaning on him to stop missing dates, it made me think of someone in a cop relationship where their relationship keeps getting pushed aside. Yeah. Kate says that Harry is almost dying every day. <laughs> that would be stressful as a partner, but Susan probably doesn't see it as a story. Op oh, sorry, but Susan probably also sees it as a story opportunity. They are both at fault, even if they do care. Yeah. Michelle says, I think he doesn't fully see her. Even if he knows that she's capable and strong, he says no to her on a work thing and expects her to honor her agreement to stay away when she's obviously up to something. Hey, Main Ogre, how are you? Welcome to the chat. Main Ogre says, thinking too long on this, a key aspect of chivalry is aiding and defending the weak. Chauvinism is assuming women are the weak. Well said. That was a quality post. Worth waiting for. Colleen says, is she willing to accept uh, that in exchange for a view into his world? Yeah. The story is a reward, says Kate, which isn't healthy either. Agree. Thierry said it perfectly. She's a thrill seeker. Yes. Um, <laughs> Alvac, you're a misogynist, Harry. I'm a war. <laughs> oh, I love that. All right, cool. So we've spoken about Susan's relationship. Do we want to get into... Oh, my gosh. We are killing time here. 
Uh, the different vampires. Thierry. Got got a, a possibly controversial opinion. Yeah. I. I'm very met about the book right now. Like it's it's interesting to hear how everyone is really really into it, and for me it's like. It's it's like watching an episode of Buffy where I'm just kind of like, eh, it's okay. Yeah. Like, I'm, not, I'm not as crazy into it as everyone else is. And I think a lot of the comments about the misogyny and stuff like that is kind of clarifying why I'm not gelling with Harry as much. As, yeah. Like, it makes me think of, um, there's these series of books, I forget the name of them, the Mercy books about werewolves and a girl who can turn into a coyote, which is a similar... Um, similar genre because it's supernatural and mystery and horror and all that stuff mixed together and most of what this conversation is doing is making me realize why I like those books more than the Dresden Files you are absolutely hitting the nail on the head with perspective you know you can have an amazing world great characters a rich story but at the end of the day when it's told through the lens of someone that you cannot connect with and honestly Radia that's not a bad thing in this case I would actually be pretty proud <laughs> to not. But thank you for sharing that. I really love that. Um, I was trying to show the picture from the Discord, but I can't save that image for some reason, Thierry. Um, so I'm trying to do a window capture, but at the moment I only have your casting. That was a PDF, wasn't it? So you can't add to it. The, the vampires. Give me a few oh, minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, we're introduced to vampires this time around. Well, we've seen Bianca before and we've kind of seen what the uh, red court are all about. thierry has got this amazing photo that goes, this is what the red court vampires look like. This is what the black court vampires look like. This is what the white court vampires are looking like. Um, so I really, I really like that. But uh, in this case, what I think is really interesting is that we're being introduced to a nightmare, an actual spirit, and then the vampires are involved as well. So it's like two parts of the supernatural world that shouldn't really be connecting, but they are for some reason somehow. So that's confusing for me because I can't really remember how this ends, which is great because a few years have been gone by since the end. Um, but what do people think about these vampires having that um, like narcotic saliva that they, if it drips on them, turns them into like easy prey in a way what did you think about with um the red court vampires anyone vampires oh I, that's um I mean, pretty cool go right ahead oh no sorry hi no, um, it's really cool uh, hi everybody hi. um it's um i liked how they he really differentiated the different kinds and well i'm i'm on the discord so i'm seeing it it's you know what demonic looking vampire the black court is more a nosferatu and well the white court is uh i guess a succubus so yeah it's a good variety there hold on i want to hear that one more time um what part the what kind of the vampires red, the red court are a lot more demonic looking yes the black court are like the nosferatu type yes you know, more, I guess, decrepit. And then um, the white court are like sucky by. Yeah. Well, they, they literally feed off energy. Yep. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Energy. Not as fun as the what we do in the Shadow Vampires, though. <laughs> Which has a Nosferatu as, uh, as well in there, though. They do. They do. Um, I think that what's really interesting is that like, you know, there is a template out there of vampire and then it's up to the author to kind of depict what kind it is, what rules are in place. Um, so far for the red vampires, it's like they are humans, but then underneath is their true form. And so like their skin kind of like folds away to reveal the truth. I don't know if we've seen sort of like the narcotic saliva and how it affects in that particular way yet is this the first sort of time that we've had that but the the staple rule of sun will kill them is true in this oh. we heard of it uh at the beginning uh, in stormfront when he meets bianca for the first time but outside of the dresden universe has there been a vampire whose saliva i mean 
in um, True Blood and yeah, I, I know an embarrassingly lot about the pop culture vampires. <laughs> but in True Blood and I think that it numbs or it seduces them a little bit, the saliva. Uh, but it's the blood that heals. So they'll well, like... Most, vam- most vampires have some sort of... Um Tizing or seducing kind of power mm. to like make sense that you'd want to um you know subdue your prey so they're not struggling right yeah so there's most of them it's like you look in their eyes and you're like hypnotized or the com- you know compulsion. that's a common vampire power so the fact that it's their saliva is interesting too because um Colleen pointed out that insects do that a lot too that like mosquitoes will numb your skin before they're biting so you don't notice that they're biting you oh they've already gotten their blood right yes wow if if for most vampire lore oh sorry no go 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 most vampire lore it takes if you want to like turn someone into a vampire it takes like you have to bite them like three or four times but if you want a constant blood supply it makes sense to want to hypnotize someone because then they keep coming back to you it's just you don't have to go hunting they come right to you yeah perfect prey i was gonna say something dumb but it's me if like the dinosaurs and velociraptors can evolve into chickens, then why can't like old school Neanderthals and I mean insects are small, but if they were big, vampire. Evolution. That's how that happened. Told you it was gonna be dumb. No, told you it was gonna be dumb, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> hold on. Kate's now oh, burning someone like, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, when uh, about the the vampires thing. Yes. Like, when I was reading this part, I was actually legitimately scared of this part because uh, I, I don't know. It, it rem- like uh, I don't know if it was just the way that it was worded or or the way that it was uh, presented. I, I have no idea. Um, but it just kind of reminds me a little bit of like my childhood, you know what I mean? Where it was like, it was like, um, it, it, presu- it presumes to be a normal event to everyone outside of the spectrum. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this is a normal occurrence. But then when you're, you're involved in it, it seems odd to you. You know what I mean? No. Does that make sense? Uh-uh. But that's, that's because I'm not grasping it. Okay, well, that's fine. The point being is that the, the vampires are very unassuming and, and they're trying to come off as not unassuming. Does that make sense? I assume not. So is I'm that, just going to move on with is this that, point. <laughs> actually, to go on that, and that's um, something that oh, – who, who said it in the comment? Uh, oh, Michelle, the idea of preppy tennis players playing vampires who are very serious about being vampires is very funny to me. So, like, they're unassuming because because of what they're wearing? Yeah, I guess that's that, that's the way of saying it, yes. If, if that's what will help you uh, understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. I'm not saying all my thoughts are winners. I'm just telling you my, my <laughs> No, I, I'm, I'm trying to get it. Sometimes I will, sometimes I won't. But that's, you know, hey, we got to just keep trying until we land it, you know? Yeah, yeah, just, just move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hold on. What? We're talking about Dracula having hairy palms? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Colleen says something very clever because it says Clever Girl 50. Evolution can create some interesting organisms. I like that. Um, Dracula is evolving. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, they're Halloween nails. Um, they have ways of blending in like a form of camouflage. That's what, got it. Colleen helped me with that one. Yes, camouflage. Because their true identity underneath, like for the red cord at least, they're, they're de- not, like demonic, demonic, dyslexic, <laughs> demonic underneath their skin, but they have a human um, disguise. Yes, got it, got it, got it. Okay, great. So we've done Red Court. Fantastic. Do we want to talk about the true sight? The true sight here is a power that I think is really, really cool. I, I love some of the world building things. I'm a wizard. So if I look someone in the eyes, 
for like a few seconds, dead eye contact, I can see into their soul. I can see what makes them up. I wonder what you would see if you soul gazed me. Like what an interesting concept. Um, and I think that's what we've got a lot in the first book, a little bit in the second book as well. T- really delicately touched upon here because he kind of mentions it, but he mentions that charity is like making basically like looking straight at him without actually making eye contact, which is a real feat in itself. But um, the soul gaze is just something that's super, super cool in the Dresden universe. Um, I'd be like, look into my eyes. You never know what they see because while they're soul gazing you, you're soul gazing them. So you're getting flashes of their essence, what makes them up. Uh, And what's really uh, interesting is that over the course of the books, the soul gaze could be things like flashes from the past, uh, like a mini, like an autobiography of like glimpses of what's made them and how they are. It can be something really kind of like thematic or symbolic, like a poisonous kind of grove. And that's what their essence represents. It's really, really cool. Uh, But something else that we've seen this time is that, you know, we've heard about the chakras, how that in the dream, this monster bit out of his stomach, which is like a very powerful chakra where his magic lives. Uh, But then this instance, his third eye. So in his magic kind of like using magic, he can will himself to open his third eye, which means he gets true sight. And true sight is kind of like an the actual representation of what things are. So if there is someone who's using a human camouflage, a disguise, you're able to see what they really are, what's lurking behind it. Uh, And again, it just showcases like that, the essence of what people really are, who they are. Um, When Harry Dresden opens up his third eye to see the true sight, he sees the spell that is wrapping around Mickey. So you can physically see the barbed wire, which you can't see in 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 the normal sight. But you, what's really impressive though is that when you open up the true sight, everything that you see, you can't unsee. It stays with you forever. And because the world sucks, um, a lot of the things that he sees and sees its truth is more ugly and not great. It's not a great thing. But when he's opened up his third eye and he's seeing Mickey and then Karen walks in and he turns around, the way that Karen's described, I went back and listened to it three times because he doesn't say much, but the way that he says it, her blazing azure eyes and her blonde sort of like fiery like hair. You could see it completely. It's kind of like when Goku goes Super Saiyan in a way where she's just sort of like lit up. Um, And she's essentially this archangel, archangel, whichever way you want to say that. Um, And that again just reminds you that she is so decent. She's really strong. She's just a freaking awesome character. Um, B Rock Vandal says, I wonder if you could block his sight with a spell. Essentially, fuck. <laughs> Essentially making his third eye blind. <laughs> that was great. That was great. I that's my humor. B Rock, you can stay. Very good. Um, Miss Necromancer says, Yeah, Karen was like a Valkyrie in the true sight. She's so cool. Which is kind of interesting because they're Mm, they exist in that world. Um, the Dresden Files are full of spir- uh, strong, spirited women. Yes and no. Yes and no. Like he does double down on it a lot. <laughs> Mr. Nakamura. <laughs> Boo, this man. Um, all right. So the things that I wanted to talk about, um, I think we've kind of made our way through all of them now. Uh, a quote that I want to mention, this book gets really, really funny. Um, and the fact that Michael and Dresden Harry are so opposite has some great one-liners. <laughs> I laughed out freaking loud at this part. It's so good. <laughs> and that is, holy shit, I breathed. Hellhounds. Harry, Michael says sternly, you know I hate it when you swear. You're right. Sorry. Holy shit, I breathed. Heckhounds. <laughs> So good. <laughs> so good. Her count. Yeah, that was absolutely the quote of the first half of this book. Hands down. Fan-freaking-tastic. Um, I've kind of covered the first half of this book. Uh, 
anyone who hasn't read the second half, are we going to do predictions? Lydia is in the mix. Lydia is somehow mixed up in all of this. A nightmare is mixed up in all of this. The vampires are mixed up in all of this. Where do you think this is going? <laughs> Well, uh, I haven't read the second half, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would assume that uh, with uh, because you know Harry, he's uh, when he when he was in the battle with the vampires, and that you know that roof fell on him or whatever, and knocked him into the sleep kind of trance or whatever it was. Uh, I feel like it's going to kind of be like, uh, for lack of a better term, Inception. Where, where Harry's going to constantly be going into that dream realm mm -hmm. and trying to solve the, whatever mystery is, is, a, is abound, you know, and, uh, and, and through that, you know, it unfolds, you know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that's the best way I can describe it. Okay. <laughs> so you'll think that they're like with the never, never and the dream, it's kind of like a Freddy Krueger kind of thing where a lot of this is going to happen within the dreams. Exactly. It's yep. going to just be like a parallel with him waking up and then going back into the dream and then waking up. Yeah. Okay. Like I like that. Kind of thing. I like that. Um, anyone got out of the predictions for the second half? Cool. Miss Mac uh, Miss Necromancer Maud Miss Necromancer has been asking how old Lydia is. I got the impression that Lydia was in her early twenties. But yeah, that was a moment where it was like, ew, ew. I will say, though, that Thierry, I've got to just do a little bit of finagling because it's not on yet. But because um, you just updated it, so I have to redo it really quickly, but it will be worth it. Window capture. We are going to look at Thierry's fan casting. Not here. Alrighty, here it is. So let me bring it up in another screen. Hopefully this will work. Alrighty, so yay or nay, uh, we've got the Discord open. So anyone in it, uh, you can unmute and join along with this. But what do we think of Harry Dresden as uh, casting here? Because I think this is pretty spot on. He just, he's a bit old now because I think he starts off in his like early 30s. But yay or nay, everyone? I think um, it's a very good choice. Especially Kristen Bell. Love it. Oh, yes. Karen Murphy? Those choices are great, um, but I uh, have an unpopular opinion. I actually liked the casting of Harry from the ill-fated tv show oh you did um, he's who, he who i see when i when i listen to the book uh but paul rathbone Bell, don't mind me yes, i'm just editing um, as we go Paul Blackstone, yeah um he's from arrow yeah yeah he is yeah that like, poor show I see, yeah it, i can't remember the series very well but i think um his look it really fits the description i have okay but, yeah yeah but i mean um, Susan and Karen Murphy there. That's good. My Suzanne, my Susan, sorry, is if you've seen, um, oh, who's that girl? It's Jess, new girl. Uh, new girl, uh, her best friend, Cece. That's who I picture as Susan. Hello, like dominatrix. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Kate says that Nicolaj is too hot. <laughs> Colleen has to go. Oh, take care. So lovely to have you in here. Uh, Kate says, I don't think Harry is that attractive. Murphy, though, is perfect. Uh, Jason M. Ball. Hello, Jason. Lovely for you to join in the chat. James Marsden is Harry Dresden. Okay. that's He's very pretty, though. I think they've described Harry as like having quite a long nose and a long face with like a pointed, like a pointed chin, right? Because someone, everyone kept joking that Matt Mercer looks like Dresden. Um, Thierry says I Paul I cast Paul Blackthorne as Harry's dad for flashbacks. Ah, oh, that's cool. That's very clever. That's how you can do that. Um, see you later, Colleen. Lovely to have you. 
Uh, Kate says that Mercer would actually be a good choice. What about David Tennant for Harry? Yeah, how's David Tennant's American accent? Probably really good. Um, alrighty, moving on. So this is Susan Rodriguez. And then we have, oh, Bob is played by James Masters because like the voice, he's the voice. That works perfectly. Uh, oh, this is from book one, isn't it? Johnny Marcone, that's book one. Ru oh, Rudolph, Detective Rudolph is Nat Wolf. Uh, Rudolph is the cop, but apparently he was supposed to be really good looking, but just really awful. He keeps saying he's got quite a pretty face. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. This is your Lydia, Kate, if that helps with um, age. Looks young, is a bit older, is my guess. Uh, Detective Ron Carmichael is here. Hello, Andy Head. Welcome. Thanks for following. Uh, we haven't seen uh, <laughs> McAnally <laughs> yet. <laughs> I can't even say it properly now that I'm seeing how it's read. <laughs> Mac, McAnally, McAnally. Oh, got to get that right. Father Forthill, Harrison Ford. I pictured a very pious man. Uh, Sean Bean as Michael Carpenter. I actually love this. I really, really dig that. Wow, Ashshaw pictures Ben Barnes as Harry Dresden. Wow, we're thinking awfully high of Harry's looks, huh? <laughs> oh, Harry's young at the beginning of the series. He's in his 20s. I always thought that he started in his 30s. Hmm. Uh, Rachel wants to know, Thierry, if you like Veronica Mars. Um, Amber Aunt earlier says, I think of Harry as more of a lanky and almost awkwardly tall, like Hamish Linklater. I'll have to look that up. Uh, yeah, Bean time. So does that mean that Michael dies if Sean Bean plays him? I know it's cursing the role completely, huh? So trusting of screen names. Uh -huh. I don't understand. I don't picture anyone reading because I have a Fantasia. So these are all interesting. Oh, I like that. Um, Farwell said the first time that I pictured Michael, he was black. That's cool. Harry is about six foot nine. Yeah, Har I thought he was like six foot six. Oh, he's really, really tall then. Wow, that's tall. Um, Kate has Ash Fantasia too. I can picture things if I really think about it, but mostly it's just data. Uh, I didn't know it was a thing until this book club. Yeah. When it was picture things, it's like I can use my imagination, but like if I actually shut my eyes and physically try to pull up an image, it's not there. But I mean, does anyone have something if you shut your eyes and it appears like in the physical sense, like living behind the eyelid? Uh, anyway, Charity Carpenter, Diane Kruger. They're cute. Uh, Mortimer Lindquist, who's, you know, a, a piece of shit con artist. This poor actor. I mean, he gets so typecast. So does Bill Sigarsgaard, actually. Uh, this is Kravos, evil looking dude. Uh, the Lananshi. I think Jessica Chastain's a great casting for that one. I thought that was really spot on. Uh, Bianca, you've cast Kate Beckinsale. I pictured like Glory from um, Buffy. That's who my Bianca was. Um, Hearth Holmes, what was that yes for? Which casting? We haven't met Thomas Wraith yet, but that's good casting. And if you need a reason to keep reading, it's right there. Um, oh my gosh, Lisa has it as well. Rachel was talking about it on Nerdist Book Club uh, and that's what let me know about it. I thought that everyone was like me and didn't actually see things in their mind. You think Rami Malek would be Thomas? I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one. Uh, Rami Malek falls into the uh, interesting, different, unique thing. Thomas is pretty beautiful. Yeah, STS, him in Doom Patrol. He's one of the best looking people on the planet. And so they wrapped him up and made him invisible. So funny. Uh, Hamish Linklater played the um, role of John Joseph Jacobs in Pushing Daisies. He's in Midnight Mass too. I haven't seen that. I don't know if I want to watch Midnight Mass though. 
Um, we oh, this is all spoiling. This is we're getting into spoiler territory there. But this is a really good start of how we can picture these characters. These are the main ones for this one. So, Thierry, thank you so much for that. It was really, really great. I really appreciate you putting that together. I love I fan casting. I have so many more. Uh, weren't you up to like 200? Close to that. All Even right. today I added a sum and I just noticed that I didn't cast the twin vampires. Oh, yeah. Kyle and Kelly. I somehow pictured Kyle. Uh, Kyle's this actor. He's been in a bunch of things. But he... Um, no. I have to confess something of what I watched if I tell you who, who he was. And I, I just don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> He's in the Twilight movies. The last one. The blonde guy. Anyway. Um... I had to say that just in case you thought it was anything worse than that. And I didn't want anything worse than that. Crash041 says, how might I submit my own books for your book club? I have a fantasy paranormal fiction trilogy called The Dream Recorder. We have a reading section in the Discord. It is a paid privilege, though. It falls under the Patreon. But we're a small company. We do have sort of staff members, contributors, paid contributors that help run a site discord um youtube etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not much at all it's five dollars a month to get access to a book club to not only talk about it every nearly every week um but to actually have a feed where we discuss books so that would be a really really good place i think it's awesome that you've written a trilogy no less um, but if anyone does want to look up stuff, I know that Lisa is bookmarking things all the time. The dream recorder. Give us a little blurb in the comments for that one. Avery says the people from Lovecraft country who played William and Christina. Oh, nice. That's some good casting. Oh yeah. Gory. Yes. That's spot on. Yeah. Isn't that good? I like that one a lot. Um, just to make sure that everyone does get some time. Strawberry Brie, I know you've been in here as well. What have been your thoughts? Have you listened to Dresden Files before? Are you familiar with this series? How have you been finding it? I'm going to pop you on the spot there, Strawberry Brie. Hey, um, Hi. I kind of had the same opinion that uh, Rydia had about it. <laughs> it. It didn't really grab me too much. Um, it's the first book, though, that I... I've ever picked up in the series so I didn't know if it was because I hadn't read book ones and two to kind of understand the backstory because right. the backstory does kind of come into play a little yeah. bit even introducing characters if you've read books one and two like they kind of didn't really cover it in a very introductory way either um has there been something that you have enjoyed about it a character a part of the world building I really did enjoy the flow. It was a very easy read. And like you said in the beginning, you know, it's a bit of a palate cleanser. It's not too heavy uh, and kept, it was kind of pretty light. Do you think you'll continue with the series? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because I love it so much that like hearing that it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. It's like, that needs to be. I am going to accept that because there's so many freaking books, you know, there's so many books out there. You do have a bit of your own magic when you have a tendency to read very deeply into things and it's actually quite admirable. And I was amazed at the things that you pulled out of the book. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, compliments. I take them very well. Um, who hasn't had a chance to speak? Lisa, are you there? I'd love to get your opinion because you read a lot. How does this series compare with other stuff that you read? I know that you say that you're in and out of the kitchen cooking. There she is. Uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Um, I do, I do really like urban fantasy type series. I think this is probably my first male written <laughs> urban fantasy so it definitely ha reads different than what I'm used to um but I I'm enjoying it I I think it's th this book is definitely better than the first two yeah um but I kind of want to go back and re-listen to it because I kind of sped through it this week so um 
I feel like I missed a lot of stuff, but I'm enjoying it. I like it. I had two listens through actually, and I was like, oh yeah, I didn't quite get that the first time. So, but because it's so fast, it's like three hours and you're done. So I like that. I like how, yeah, easy they are to just consume these books. Who else hasn't had a chance? Jay Bunt Rock. Are you there? I'd love to hear your thoughts about this book. How have you been enjoying it? Have you listened to any other ones? Will you continue? Hello. Hi. Yeah, I read book one a long, long time ago, mm-hmm. and then I, I loved it, but I, I joined the Navy and my book reading fell apart. So mm. I had book two on my shelf for years and years, so it was fun to finally, I just finished it yesterday and then read chapters one through 20 today, and I already knew I would love this. This is my sort of thing, so. Okay. <laughs> so, wow, you didn't go back to one because you'd read it a while ago, but you just powered through two and the first half of this chapter, this book today. So it's super fresh in your mind. Yeah, and book two two was on my shelf of shame, you know, books that you say you're going to get to and stare at you for a long time. So it was fun to actually knock one of those out. <laughs> How long did it take you to read? Book two I read in a couple days. And then, like I said, I read chapter one through 20 this today, today during, yeah. through breaks at work. <laughs> yeah, wow. Oh, I'm so glad that you were here. Do you have any standout characters? Are you a fan of Harry, his inner dialogue? Yeah, I guess I know because I, I wondered what the what the chauvinist thing would come up because he's always noticing every part of a woman. Like if, if, I don't know, every char- every female character that shows up, he's always noticing their body. But uh, but uh, my favorite character is from book two. I really love Tara, but it seems like she's not gonna come back. But oh. she's she's actually it. They, they mentioned that I think she lives in the Pacific Northwest where I live. So oh, that's funny. <laughs> Keep an eye out. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I totally forgot about book two. It's been a while since I listened to that one. I think it was the beginning of the year, even February. Oh, well, I'm glad yeah, you're on Tara, board. Tara, Tara was the wolf that could turn into a human. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, who got in with Marcone. Yes. No, not Marcone. The Lugaru. No, I'm scared to say uh, it. McFinn. His name was McFinn. McFinn. That's it. That's it. We're getting there. Um, Oh, we're talking about next books already. I love that. Uh, We actually do have a spreadsheet where everyone has contributed uh, their favorite books. So we have no shortage of books to read. That's for sure. Uh, Yeah, David, you should probably read some books, especially in a book club. Uh, Emma Cartographer said it would be interesting to read Dead Witch Walking by Kim Harrison to contrast with this. I will say this so loudly, especially because he's not here, but Aaron, Game Wizard, has recommended this book as his number one for like years now. For like the last two years, he's been hammering this to the point where I bought it twice on Audible. (laughs) There's two different versions of it and I had both of them on my phone because I was like, oh wow, because of his recommendation. So I've got that one. I'd be on board because it's kind of like, yeah, a female Dresden, right? Uh, that's really cool. I want to go back to Crash 041's blurb. Dream Recorder follows Gregory Peel, Abby George, and the woman known as Ninja as they have adventures and misadventures in the dreamscape. Ooh. Yeah, we need to get your author name. Drop that in the chat too. Hearth Home says, so many books, so little time. So many streamers, so little time. So much content. Seriously. That's how that goes. Um... Terry says it does get better and the misogyny does get toned down. Uh, Nora before was asking, how do I know ahead of time what to read for the club? Hello, Nora. Welcome. Uh, We try to announce it a little bit ahead. Uh, The Discord, we will tell you sort of like a week before at least what book it's going to be in the announcements. Um, If you're in hashtag reading, you'll know as soon as the decision is made. Uh, We usually know ahead of time and we kind of lock in the schedule for that over in the Discord. Uh, It is a a paid section in the Discord though. Uh, But yes, Miss Necromancer is exactly correct. If you follow Geek Bomb or myself on Twitter, we will usually post it there as well. We haven't locked in November's book yet. Uh, Next week, we'll be finishing the discussion on this book in its entirety. And according to that summary, which was that long, uh, we got a lot ahead of us which is going to be really really cool um in november i thought we were going to do andy weir's book that hail mary are we going to do hail mary next month do we think 
I also really want to do Murderbot. Um, and Kate actually jumped in the Discord, hashtag reading, to drop another recommendation. The Last House on Needless Street by Katrina Ward. It really subverted my expectations at the end. I was actually sad when I stopped reading it because it left me checking my own expectations and sad and hopeful all at once. Whoa. Oh, BMW Lucky 17. Oh, I'm reading Hail Mary right now. Oh, Avery said, we talked about Project Hail Mary or Mistborn. Uh, Lisa says, we were talking about The Final Empire, the first of the Mistborn series. Uh, ooh. I think that's the end of the year then, huh? Do we want to do Project Hail Mary or Mistborn next? Because one of them is going to be it. What's more of a November book and what's more of a December book? <laughs> Mistborn, I've, I mean, I finished it a couple of months ago. Weeks? Months ago? I sense a poll in the Discord. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, it looks like the rest of the year is already mapped out for us. And then we'll do another Dresden in there next year. We'll do some more. What other series did we start? Oh, wait, we did the whole damn Shadow and Bone series, huh? Oof. Maybe a shorter one for December slash holidays. I like that. Uh, I don't know how big project. You could do, like, for November, we could do either Miss Bourne, like, or a Brandon Sanderson book, because there's this other series, too. Or we could do Project Hail Mary. And then December, we could do the next Dresden, because they're short. Ooh. What's the next Dresden? <laughs> J Bunt Rock, that's not even funny. <laughs> he commented in the Discord Foundation Book 4. <laughs> no. <laughs> God, they were tough for me. Oh, it's Summer Night. Ooh. I. Oh, that was really good. Okay. All right. So we want to do. Because Mistborn's chonky. Mistborn's like, ugh. Ugh, you know. Like I read half of it in 2014 and then reread the entire thing from like March to June. <laughs> Radia finished Mistborn about a month ago. Gory wants Christmas vibes for that December. Yeah, Mistborn's about sort of like usurping a tyrant using science magic <laughs> summer night digs more into the fairy world fairy world uh kate says a chunky book in december isn't good unless we want to read a real thick one and make it for december and january together i think something i think the next dresden in december is going to be super easy pow 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 okay there isn't did i get it no did i get it no <laughs> where did it go then Oh, well, it was a little gnat. I have flowers in my apartment, so they just love them. Anyway, that's time, everyone. That was fantastic. If you haven't followed the Discord, go do that now. If you want to be a part of the actual Discord chat, where our lovely chat are, uh, say hello, chat, on three. One, two, three. Hello. Hello. There was a delay. I can't. My heart broke that first second. My heart broke. I was like, we practice. Like, we're getting better at this. Yeah. So if you want to get in there, um, just join the lowest tier on patreon.com slash geekbomb. $5 a month. You get three book clubs, uh, two with Geekbomb, one after show with Nerdist, which is technically two book which is technically two books every single month. We do a lot of reading over here and we talk about it almost 24 seven. So it'd be great to have you in that amazing community on the first try. I don't think I've got it, but like, how is it still alive? You know, like I was aggressive. Ugh. Uh, next week, finish the book. We're gonna be reading the rest of Grave Peril and talking about the rest of this book. I'll see <laughs> Out of vision. Gifted a sub to, oi, oi, oi. <laughs> Ah, uh, ah, uh, dear. Um, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oi, oi, oi. Anyway, I'm trying to leave. Thank you, Adam, for lurking this entire time. You sweet, sweet, sweet man. Um, I'll see you next week, next Wednesday, 5 p.m. PT. Let's read this. If you haven't, let's get it done. Excited for it. Talk to you then. Bye, everyone. Who should we raid? Who should we raid? Who's online? Anyone want to raid? Say goodbye already. I already said goodbye.
Gory, I'll play the board. You're very, very welcome. If you do want to talk books, this is the place to do it. Because this is the place. We love books over here. More people need to talk about books as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Gaia. Uh, Gory, it's over to you. Who do you think we should pass it on to? Lou, love it. Let's raid into Lush's Lou. Lush's Lou is longtime supporter of Geek Bomb. He's in our highest backing tier. So let's pass that love back. Give him a very warm welcome. He just celebrated his 12 month support of Geek Bomb as well. So this will be sweet. Hold on. What's his. Why aren't I getting it? Lush is Lou. Lush is Lou. It says no results found. How is that? That's BS. Am I getting it wrong? Glory, can you do it for me? Can you do it? He just left. <laughs> I tell you what, the start of this stream sucked. The end is not crash hot either. So who are we doing it then? Gory, it's your call. Ciao, Jordan. Done. Ciao, Jordan is currently playing Phasmophobia. It looks like she just got on. She's got five people watching. So let's absolutely bombard her and make her feel so welcome. And Phasmophobia is great for October vibes as well. So let's raid... Don't say ciao, Jordan. Say hi, Jordan. Okay? We love this. Bye, everyone. See you next Wednesday. Oh, no. <laughs>